when it comes to writing secure and safe code, there are very few companies facing the same level of pressure as NASA. After all, if my code breaks in production, the worst thing that can happen is that I might get a 6am call from an angry customer. If NASA's code breaks in production, it could ruin a $3 billion rover, which is currently 55 million kilometers away on a completely different planet. So, naturally, when NASA has something to say about coding best practices, we all should shut up, sit down and take notes. And, luckily for us, they did exactly that. In 2006, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab published The Power of 10, which is a set of 10 simple but strict rules for writing C code that won't unexpectedly detonate your spacecraft. What's really interesting is that these rules are more relevant than ever now, they apply to any programming language, and they are actually surprisingly easy. Let me show you. First of all, you should restrict all code to very simple control flow constructs. In other words, always value simplicity over cleverness. The reason is straightforward. Once control flow stops being linear, it stops being provable. Recursive calls make stack usage unpredictable and go to statements, turn execution paths into an impossible mess of edge cases and dead ends. And, granted, the chances are you are coding in a higher level programming language and you might have never used a go-to statement. But that doesn't mean you're off the hook because complexity hides everywhere. It hides in deeply nested if statements, in try-catch pyramids, in async callbacks inside other async callbacks. It hides in clever abstractions that no one wants to touch six months later. As I always say, good code is readable and easy to understand. Second, every loop should have a compile time verifiable limit. In other words, your code shouldn't contain unbounded while loops, shouldn't rely on manual breaks on arbitrary conditions, and shouldn't access external state to eventually end things. NASA wants every single loop to be statically analyzable, with a hard ceiling on how many iterations it can run, because they really don't trust your assumptions about edge cases. The problem with dynamic lookups is that they work perfectly until one day they don't. A sensor could return a garbage value, or a packet never arrives. Even more plausible, an external dependency could change its behavior and suddenly you're stuck in an infinite loop, burning CPU and draining batteries. By contrast, fixed-bound loops are predictable. They guarantee that no matter what, execution will move forward after an exact number of steps. This is an important step in an attempt to have your program explicit, finite and traceable, which brings us to an awesome piece of trivia. The Mars rover is built as a state machine because this architecture makes every possible behavior explicit. At its core, the rover software is organized as a hierarchy of states with explicit transitions driven by events, sensor input, timers and fault conditions. It operates by transitioning between clearly defined states like idle, navigate, analyze sample, transmit data or panic and each state has well-known entry and exit conditions. That means you can simulate the entire system, prove that it won't get stuck, and test what happens when a command fails or a sensor misfires. Back to the second rule, the main lesson is that your code should always be predictable with failsafe mechanisms for any edge cases or errors that might occur. Next, there should be no dynamic memory allocation after initialization. Dynamic memory allocation during runtime can lead to unpredictable behavior, memory fragmentation or allocation failures, especially in systems with limited resources like spacecraft or embedded controllers. Granted, this rule might not apply to everybody, but the principle behind it absolutely does. Don't introduce uncertainty at runtime. Now, the fourth rule is a fun one because it starts a lot of debates. No function should be longer than what can be printed on a single sheet of paper in a standard format with one line per statement and one line per declaration. Typically, this means no more than about 60 lines of code per function. There are entire book chapters written about the acceptable length for a function, and the reality is that there isn't a correct answer. Sure, there are some general rules like functions should only focus on one thing or that shorter functions are easier to test. But, in reality, we all ran into scenarios where things were messy, interconnected and couldn't be cleanly broken down without either introducing meaningless wrapper functions or splitting logic in ways that hurt readability more than they helped. But having a hard set limit like NASA is doing might actually help in the long run. Sure, it will make your life harder when writing the code, but you'll be happy it did six months from now when you have to read or modify it. Next, each function should perform defensive checks and each function should contain at least two assert statements. You might be familiar with the concept of defensive programming, where you are writing code under the assumption that everything can go wrong and you are preparing for all edge cases in advance. While your code might look cleaner without a lot of defensive checks in place, good programmers know that these are a must regardless of the product they are building. 
This is also why modern programming languages, which are designed to build reliable things, treat errors as values and force you to handle them explicitly. Another important rule is to declare all data objects at the smallest possible level of scope. In plain terms, don't declare variables globally unless absolutely necessary. If a variable is only used inside one function, declare it inside that function, and if it's only used inside a loop, declare it inside that loop. It is important to keep the scope as narrow as possible, because the broader the scope, the more parts of the codebase can interact with a variable intentionally or not. And, every additional access point is an opportunity for a bug, a race condition, or an unintended side effect. So unless your variable needs to live across multiple calls or across modules, keep it close to where it's used. Next, you should always check the validity of all function return values and parameters. This one sounds obvious, but it's one of the most violated rules in real-world codebases. NASA's approach is simple. If a function returns something, it's for a reason. Either it's giving you a result, or it's telling you something went wrong. If you don't check that value, you are ignoring valuable information. And in safety-critical systems, ignoring data is how accidents happen. Back to some modern examples, languages like Rust and Go actually encourage this pattern by making it explicit. In Rust, if you don't handle a result, the compiler will throw an error, and in Go, ignoring an error return makes your code harder to justify in a code review because it's clearly visible that you didn't handle the possible failure. The eighth rule is indeed a bit more specific to the C programming language. In C, a macro is a kind of preprocessor directive and runs before the actual code is compiled. You write it using define, and it will simply copy and paste text into your program before the compiler ever sees it. That's the key point to understand. Macros are not functions, and they are not evaluated. They are pure text substitution, so whatever you write on the right-hand side of a define gets blindly injected into your code wherever the macro name appears. Macros in C bypass the type system and the scope rules, and it is a general rule, regardless of the programming language, to never bypass the rules and checks put in place by the compiler. The ninth rule is exciting for anybody who still has nightmares from their university days when they were learning about memory addresses and pointers, because according to NASA, the use of pointers must be restricted. A single pointer is already enough to cause a null dereference, a segmentation fault, or a memory leak. Add in multiple levels of indirection with pointers to pointers to structs containing pointers, and now you're navigating a maze of memory relationships with no guardrails. You can't prove where the data lives, who owns it, or whether it's even valid anymore. Finally, you should always compile with all warnings enabled and fix them. We all worked on projects where the compilation process looked like a Christmas tree filled with flashing warnings and suggestions. The harsh reality is that such projects are a clear sign of a lack of interest and programming bad practices. Sure, some warnings like unused variables, implicit typecasts, or the React-friendly missing dependency in an array seem harmless, but those are exactly the kind of things that cause subtle bugs in production. So NASA's power of 10 rules are actually really simple and straightforward, therefore you have no excuse to ignore them. If you enjoyed my rambling about software topics, you should check out one of these videos next. Please don't forget to violently smash all the buttons YouTube is throwing at you these days, and until next time, thank you for watching.